Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing protecting and restoring our rivers and watersheds with Maya Von Rossum, the Delaware Riverkeeper and founder of Green Amendments for the Generations. So, Maya, thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited. I have never met the Delaware Riverkeeper. Wow. Oh, I'm so excited. So could you could you describe what the Delaware Riverkeeper is? Sure. So I first of all, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm always happy to talk about my beautiful Delaware River, as well as the new Green Amendments movement that is an outgrowth of that of that work. Um, but I have had the honor of serving as the Delaware Riverkeeper for nearly 30 years now. And my technical job description is to be the voice of the Delaware River and to make sure that anytime anybody anywhere is making a decision that could harm or help the river, that the needs of the river aren't just heard and understood, but are given the highest priority in the decision-making process. Uh, but of course, the Delaware River is 330 miles long. It flows through portions of four states. The watershed is 13,539 square miles, and the Delaware Riverkeeper Network works with communities throughout that entire watershed, um, serving the, the protection of the Delaware River and all of its tributary streams. And so that is really, um, you know, giving the Delaware River a voice in our human world and ensuring its protection is not really the job of a single person, as we can tell. It's the job of a community. And that's what the, what the Delaware Riverkeeper Network is. It's the community of people that work with me in order to protect the Delaware River, its tributaries, its watershed, and all the communities, human and non-human, who depend upon them. And I didn't realize that it is the longest uh, undammed river, 330 miles, as you say, uh, east of the Mississippi. That's that. That's pretty amazing. And it affects New York, New Jersey, uh, Delaware, Pennsylvania. Um, it, it, it has a tremendous, tremendous impact on the economies of the, whether it's it's pure business economies, it's it's tourism, it's enjoyment, it's recreation, it's the environment of, of an entire region of the of the country where there is a, a, a there are a huge number of of, of people, we're talking about basically supplying five uh, water to five percent of the nation's population, right? So that's more than fifteen million people. It's it's just amazing. But let me ask you uh, a question about the nature of nature. Um, we have seen nature as an exploitable resource for the benefit of humans which has led to how we treat our natural environment as a source of infinite wealth from which we extract a livelihood, extract resources that we then consume and use. Whereas when you talk about being the voice of a river, it basically transforms the river into a, 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 a place with a spirit, a, a quasi-human uh, character. Um, how do you and your constituents see that and, and how do you interact with people who see nature in a different way as, as, as sort of there to be uh, exploited by human beings? Aren't we anthropomorphizing um, a, 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 um, something that is really made out of elements and so on? Are we giving it a spirit that it doesn't necessarily have in an artificial no. way? Yes. So that's not, that's not how I view it. Do it. Um, you know, all of the creatures, all of the elements of this earth are their own entity, are their own being. Um, and I think that um, it, it would take a lot of hubris for me to ascertain, you know, whether it's spiritual aspects or otherwise, you know, what are all the elements of all of these entities that share this earth with us? What I do know is whether you're talking about a river, you're talking about an animal, you're talking about a tree, a forest, nature, all of these entities were placed here on this earth for some reason by, you know, I don't even know how, just like people were placed here on this earth. And, and, 
Um, I think it's very presumptuous for us to think that we have the right to exploit these resources, these other entities, to use them in a way to service our wants, our goals, our needs, our desires to their detriment. So I just, you know, think that that is fundamentally wrong. But People don't have to share my perspective on that for us to really be on the same page to recognize that it is critically important for us to protect our environment, whether you're protecting it for the environment's sake or for people's sake. Because when we do exploit our natural resources, when we contaminate our waterways, when we use up too much water, when we kill off the critters or we cut down the forest or we spew pollution into the air, um, causing air pollution or a climate crisis, not only are we hurting these other entities, however it is that you view them, but we are actually fundamentally harming people and harming every aspect of the lives of people. We are um, harming their health. And for some people, that means we are literally taking their life. We are harming the quality of our lives. When people don't live healthy lives, breathing you know, clean air and drinking clean water and enjoying beautiful nature, the quality of their life diminishes. We are undermining job creation and healthy economies when we decimate these natural resources because businesses of all kinds also need clean and healthy environments to function, whether they need clean water in order to manufacture their products or whether they need healthy workers that aren't dealing with the ravages of flooding or flood damages or the health consequences of pollution, right, um, that prevents them from going to work. So the truth is, you know, we're all going to have our own personal belief system when it comes to nature. Some will think of them um, as having a spirit. Some of them will think of them as being, as not. <laughs> I don't really um, pretend to know how other people experience the natural world. But what I do know is that all of us are harmed when we exploit and decimate and pollute and contaminate and destroy the natural world because we the people are part of the ecosystem. We are part of this natural world. And when we decimate it, we decimate ourselves. So you're you're spending a lot of time talking uh, to people with different uses of the river, different ideas around the river, different representing different interests. You're dealing with governments. I mean, I I must have uh, drunk of, uh, of the watershed's water, um, having traveled pretty extensively throughout the region. So I've, I've consumed, I've extracted from the river for, for my own bodily uh, nourishment. You have uh, municipalities that are organizing that process so that they can deliver to their citizens water. You have businesses whose ships are using the navigable uh, portions of the river to transport products. And you have water being used by by uh, plants um, that that are um, that are uh, uh, using the water for their industrial purposes. But then you have water that is used by plants that are used just to grow and create habitat and so on. How do you balance the various interests? Because each person has their own perspective and tends to defend their perspective as reveal truth and the and the thing that is so, most important. But then you have somebody on the other side of, of the shore who might have a different use for the river or might have a different perspective. How do you deal with this without becoming just a bunch of people who are throwing arrows at each other's in each other's directions and going into lawsuits and so on. How do you avoid that kind of conflict? Uh, well, sometimes you can't avoid it. Um, and that's just part of our reality. And my job is really to protect the natural ecosystems of the Delaware River in order to protect the communities, again, the human communities and the non-human communities that depend upon them. And, you know, my perspective is that no single person or entity or industry has a right to use nature in a way that destroys it for others. That results in- okay, let's, let, 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 let's stop for a second. Could you repeat that? No single interest person entity has a right to use the resource in a way that destroys it for others. That's really interesting. Right. So that's, that's, so that's the guiding light of, of what you're saying. You know, you can use it, but you can't destroy it for others. Exactly. 
exactly. And and I don't care who you are or what you're you're you're, you're doing. There's always a way to do things that are environmentally protective always and one of the obligations of our government is to make sure that individuals interests industries facilities operations are following a set of rules that ensures that they are operating in a way that protects nature at the same time now that being said right it is clear sometimes it's how we frame the 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 question or the idea that we're talking about so for example when you're talking about um the energy industry when we're talking about energy creation there is absolutely a way to create energy that gives us the energy we need and protects our natural resources for the benefit of all people including present and future generations and protects nature for nature's sake but there are some ways of creating energy that just have devastating consequences and you cannot make them safe. You cannot make fracking for gas from shale safe. So yes, you may be able to do it in a way that's a little bit less intensive or not, but the truth is fundamentally at its core, fracking for gas from shale in order to create, create electricity is not sustainable and it necessarily just in the way that that industry operates, does destroy nature for everybody else, including future generations. And so when we're looking at that question of how can um, um, this operation or this industry advance in a way that fulfills sort of my guiding principle of nobody has the right to use nature in a way that takes it from others, um, other communities and, and or nature itself, when you're looking at that question, like how do we, um, in the energy context, see, yeah, the, the question has to be framed in how do we make energy in a way that meets that guiding principle and understand that there are some aspects of energy creation where you can't do that. So the question can't be, how do we make fracking safer? Because you can't make fracking happen in a way that meets that guiding principle. The question has to be, how do we create energy in order to serve our goals and our needs? Does that make you're sense? Also, you're, you're also uh, begging another question, which is that um, if, if we're going to be listening to each other, then uh, traditionally power in politics um, very often follows um, it follows the money, right? And, and those who have more voice, more power, um, are, are able to advance their ideas. What you're basically saying is that actually, if you level the uh, playing field and you take money out of it, you end up having to listen to somebody on the other side of the river who might not um, have an industrial plant. But if the principle is that the industrial plant is depriving somebody else of their use of that resource, then that means that you have to listen to that other person because they have an intrinsic right not to have their access to that resource destroyed, right? And it goes the other way as well, right? In other words, if you have environmentalists and people who love nature and untouched nature, and they want to preserve that untouched nature in a way that deprives somebody else of the use of that nature, either as a drinking water source or in or in some other way, people have to listen to each other. People have to listen to each other. People also have to be guided by science and facts, um, reality and morality. Um, and one of the things, you know, that at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network that we have successfully advanced and are advancing within the boundaries of the watershed, which has led to the outgrowth, actually, of my national green amendments for the generations movement, is that one of the ways you accomplish the leveling of the playing field in this in our current political and legal dynamic is to make the right to clean water, clean air, a stable climate and healthy environments, a constitutional right that is recognized and protected 
in the same way we recognize and protect other fundamental human inalienable rights we hold dear, like the right to free speech and freedom of religion. Right now, the way environmental law works um, across our nation at the state level and at the federal level is we have a system of laws that is very literally focused on legalizing environmental pollution and degradation to the point where industry believes that it is their right and their entitlement. There is, we are not operating in a situation where actually the people have an enforceable right to a clean, safe, and healthy environment. And this has fed the dynamic that you just talked about. The power lies with politics and industry and money and people, you know, who are able to, to politically posture and rub shoulders. And for regular people, particularly communities of color and indigenous communities and low income communities, but really all people, for the rest of us, we're kind of left at the mercy of this system. And when this system falls out of whack and when industry and government are allowed to go so far that Pollution is being spewed into our environment in the way, in ways that are giving kids cancer and killing them, causing ADHD and Alzheimer's and heart disease in everybody else, and really desecrating our healthy lives and our economies as well. There is no counterbalance. There's no reason why the politicians and industry have to listen to we, the people who are being harmed, because the law says that they can do this the way the law is written. But when we lift up the right to a, of all people to a clean, safe, and healthy environment, including future generations, to that constitutional level, where we, the people, are literally taking back that fundamental inalienable right um, bringing it back unto ourselves under the Constitution, which is what we've done with all of those other rights in the Bill of Rights section of our state and federal constitutions, then when industry and government goes too far, we the people can not only say you have crossed the moral line, you have crossed the line of infringing on a human right, but you have crossed the, the, the constitutional line. You have violated the constitutional rights of the people. And now, as you said, you must listen to us and you must act in a way that ensures your behavior, your actions and your activities only proceed in a way that is fair, equitable and protective of the environment but, for the rest but of us. Let's, let's take a look at that. Um, you know, we have 350 million people in this country and you and I have both driven uh, uh, cars that are constructed by absorbing huge amounts of energy and uh, they consume uh, fossil fuels. Um, even the batteries, the electric um, uh, transition to, to quote sustainable energy requires mining on a grand scale of rare earths and, and other materials and they absorb a lot of energy to produce. Uh, we can't turn on a dime to create all of a sudden a more sustainable, more organic uh, economy and retain jobs and so on and so forth. How do you deal with with the reality that we can't just flip a, a, a light switch? Yes, over the long term, these principles are principles that no one would argue with. But in the meantime, we we do need our natural gas and our propane. Uh, we do need uh, uh, fossil fuels. We do need um, uh, these rare earths. Um, this is always going to be a debate. How do we get beyond the, the um, accusatory stage in which one side is accusing the other of having nefarious intent just because they're working in their own, in their own interests? and instead develop real solutions. Are you developing with your counterparts who might disagree with you in certain areas, real approaches that accommodate perhaps imperfectly each side's um, objectives? Are you making the compromises and are you encouraging other people to make the compromises of, of individual inter interests and sensibilities in a way that, that moves us forward together? So you are presuming that we're in a situation where there is equitable power and there is interest um, on behalf of industry to listen to the alternative perspectives, to actually 
consider the reality of science rather than put forth climate uh, climate change denying um, messages and messaging and arguments within You're right. the I am, I, I am assuming I am assuming that that there is a willingness on both sides. And frankly, I've experienced unwillingness on each side, but I've also experienced, particularly in private moments, where people um, are conceding the points made by the others. So you're absolutely right. I do assume that sort of ability to to come to the table, even if one is powerful and is dealing with uh, and and uh, and uh, wealthy and and has the ability to to uh, use a hammer that one withholds that just to listen and to be informed. I do assume that that's true. Yeah. And so one of the one of the um, most important pathways that I pursue is creating that legal structure, right? This is the this is the fundamentally important role of government to understand that you are going to have sort of different push pushes and pulls, and it is the obligation of government to make sure that we are putting in place that system that ensures that everybody is advancing in a way that is respectful and protective of the rights of others, right? So. I don't have to presume that industry is going to like me or listen to me. What I have, what I know is we've put together, we've put in place through our government system a, an obligation that they behave in a way that is protective and rational and realistic and makes sense and is protective of our environment for all. So that is how I do a lot of my work. It's about I don't have to go into the oil and gas industry and say, please, please, please listen to me, agree with me, let me convince you to do the right thing. Because frankly, more times than not, that is not going to work. What will work is to put in place this rational legal system that ensures that when energy industries operate, that they are obliged to operate in a way that is protective of the environment and protective of everybody else here on this earth that shares this earth with us, with us. And if they cannot do that, if their operations are such that they cannot accomplish that obligation, then they are not the right industry to continue to move forward and maybe they need to go away. And then some people get alarmed and say, oh my gosh, Maya, you're trying to shut down business and industry. No, what I'm doing is ensuring that we have an evolution. Um, we have a change to businesses and industries that can behave in a way that accomplish legitimate goals, but protect our communities and protect our environment at the same time. And that is the history of the world, right? We used to we used to walk and then we rode bikes and then we had the horse and buggy and then we had fossil fuel cars and now we do have clean energy cars. And my clean energy car is operated by the solar panels on my roof. And you're right, there are elements that are necessary to get, you know, to make those solar panels. But there are different ways to get those elements out of the earth. Sometimes that can be an incredibly destructive way, but there are also ways that are not destructive. And if we don't yet have those ways, then and we put in place laws that force those ways. And that is actually one of the valuable lessons of the initial set of environmental protection laws that went to play, went into place here in the United States of America, like the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. Those technologies or those um, laws are what we call technology forcing. So they are designed to say, what is going to be the appropriate scientifically defensible um, uh, um, water quality requirements for a waterway that we have to achieve to protect people, to protect nature um, going forward. And then the industries have, and we put those into law and into standards and into permits and industries that can't meet that obligation, they don't continue to operate or what, ha what is supposed to happen and has happened is, whoa, lo and behold, super smart people develop the technologies to accomplish their industrial operations or their business goals and meet those water quality protection standards. The laws originally were designed to operate that way and operated that way very beautifully. And somewhere along the line, 
Industry did get a hold of this process, did get a hold of the politicians and convinced them that that was not the right approach, despite you know, years and years of proof that it actually worked. And now our laws have become one of uh, one where we are just locking in the status quo, where industry is entitled to pollute and damage and desecrate, despite the fact that we are devastating, literally devastating and taking people's lives. And so that is, you know, we need to look at all of that, look at our history and just understand when we put in the proper laws, um, we have the appropriate advancement. And that's what I'm talking about. And that's where, you know, one of the key missing pieces is this constitutional right. We all know that we, that we as people do have a right to clean water and clean air. That is a right that we are born with, that we have a right to healthy environments, just like we were born with the right to free speech and freedom of religion. We need to elevate those rights to that highest constitutional level to make sure that when our laws are passed and implemented, they are passed and implemented with an eye towards protecting those fundamental rights, not towards granting entitlements to industry so they can so make more money. So does that mean that we have a right to clean air regardless to what our income level is? What 100%. our neighborhood is? Does that mean that we have the right to actually clean water that is drinkable regardless as to what neighborhood we, li we live in, what section of the country that we live in? Does that mean we have the right to uh, foods that are not polluted by microplastics regardless as to where, where we are? That that is is your position. Yes, that is what I'm talking about. And when we when we put this right into the Bill of Rights section of our Constitution in what I call a green amendment. And by the way, there are three states, Pennsylvania, Montana and New York that have these green amendments, but we're working to get them in every state across the nation. When we have these um, provisions in the Bill of Rights section of our state constitutions, and ultimately we hope to get a federal green amendment, what it means is that every time government acts, puts in place a law, issues a permit, right, sets up uh, new regulations, that government must be working to accomplish that goal of protecting environmental rights. So that is how the Bill of Rights section of the Constitution operates. It focuses on government action, activities, and behaviors. So that's how this constitutional environmental rights amendment, what I call a green amendment, also will function. It's not going to result in a downstream neighbor suing an upstream farmer or a farmer suing an industrial operator. It's going to be focused on the government actions and activities that will ensure equitable protection of the environmental rights for all people, regardless of race, ethnicity, income level, geography, generation, gender, just as you said. It's an interesting response because the, the embedded assumption in this country uh, has always been that clean air, clean water, clean land is an infinite resource. And as we become aware that it's not an infinite resource, that indeed in our crowded earth, that um, we are constantly encountering the, uh, the discard of human activity, that maybe we need to look at that really purposefully and get involved to ensure that that human beings and and ecosystems can thrive despite the fact that we are all over the place right we're we're everywhere human beings are everywhere and and the impact of our activity is is being felt by us to our detriment uh this has just been a fantastic conversation maya von rossum the delaware riverkeeper and founder of green amendments for the generations thank you so much for sharing the sensibility of, of your organization and yourself and, and your constituents, your funders, your volunteers uh, with us. Thank you for informing us. And, and uh, really, thank you for your insights. Thank you for the great conversation. I really appreciate your perspective on it all. Well, I appreciate yours. Thanks.